It's time for This Board Game Life, episode number 26, titled What's Your Game? The show was recorded on Saturday, July 13th, 2013 in the This Board Game Life studios. So in this show, we're going to be talking about what's been going on with This Board Game Life over the last couple of months since the last show, and a little bit of Kickstarter talk, and uh, we're going to start going through a whole ton of games that are in the backlog. And uh, so let's get going. the show about board games the people that play them and pretty much anything else that uh, is relevant or i feel like talking about i'm rob your host for the show and i gotta say it's really good to be back in the recording chair it's, it's been uh, way too long since the last show got released but one thing is that this is this i think about the fifth or sixth time that this show has been recorded and i'm re-recording it yet again because uh, I keep meaning to release it. That never happens, but this is going to be the final time, and you guys will be listening to this show for sure. You know, what's been going on with uh, the sport game life uh, over the past couple months? Well, uh, quite a lot. Unfortunately, the the podcast hasn't been released in quite some time, as uh, episode uh, 25 came out a couple months ago. And, And by the way, that was probably one of my most favorite episodes that I've done so far. I had uh, Gamer Chris on as a special guest host for that show. So, uh, you know, what's been going on with Board Game Life? Well, uh, uh, quite a bit, like I said. So uh, it's it all started off with uh, a redesign of a lot of stuff. I went through and I redesigned the logo. Uh, the site got redesigned. A whole new look to everything. Much brighter, uh, much more, let's say, current, if if that's a good way to put it. So, um, you know, I, I hope everybody likes that. Uh, and I'm pretty pleased with how it's turned out so far. The website has gotten, you know, quite a bit of a makeover and there's some additional stuff that's planned for it. So if you haven't been to the website yet, you know, definitely check it out, you know, over the next couple of weeks, maybe a month or two, I'm going to be adding some more pretty neat stuff to it as I, as I get the time. One thing that I'm finding is a lot of this tough, just, I mean, it just takes an incredible amount of time mainly because a lot of this stuff is, is new to me, you know, using all these different software packages, you know, learning the technologies. It, it just takes a lot longer than, you know, somebody who's more experienced in it. But it, it's been uh, pretty cool. It's been really, really cool trying to, you know, do everything myself. Like for the logo, I mean, that was uh, learning, you know, Adobe products and it, just a lot of like redoing things, uh, a lot of trial and error, I got to say. Video courses are awesome, and also YouTube. It's it's amazing how it's like, hey, how do I do this one thing? And you just go up there and you search on YouTube, and it's like, hey, fifty videos that tell you how to do that exact thing. So I'm uh, you know really thankful for all those people that are uh, very creative, and they put out these videos on YouTube to help people learn Adobe products. You know, other than uh, the site and the logo. And by the way, the logo has been pushed out everywhere so far. It's up on the site. There's, uh, you know, it's up on the Twitter feeds and also on Board Game Geek as well. So, uh, and, and on the Facebook group as well. So it, it's all out there. And, uh, you know, after all of that stuff was done, the next shift came to doing uh, videos. Yes, yes, yes. So this has been something that I've been playing with for, for quite some time and I finally decided to do it earlier this year and that's you know to do all sorts of different videos you know there's a lot of people out there that do you know your, your typical video playthrough or they'll do a quick review you know it's and and they do a great job of it you know do we really need somebody else doing that as well well hopefully I'll bring, uh, you know, kind of a different look into some of these games. You know, I'm not going to be doing the same thing over and over. You know, for some, I'll just show you the components or something that's interesting about the game or something that, you know, is pretty cool that I've done with the game. And just stuff that I, I feel is, you know, interesting that, you know, I feel that other people would like to know. So, you know, I started the initiative to work on the YouTube videos and, and wow. I've done more than 
250 audio podcasts, and that did not even prepare me, even in the slightest, to do the videos. It's so different, and the, the video camera, in terms of mistakes, it's, it's not forgiving. It's a lot harder to edit video than it is audio. It's like, oh my gosh. I mean, well, let, let me take that back. It's not that it's harder. It's just that if you're doing an audio podcast, if I flub something, I can go in there and I can trim it out. Usually pretty easy, you know, especially if you're using a really cool tool like Adobe Audition, where it's got all these different avenues for, you know, repairing and, and healing audio. Well, you know, you, you can't do the same thing with video. It's, it's just, I mean, if your hand is blocking something or if the video is fuzzy, it's, you know, you're done. You, you can't fix that. So that really surprised me. It was something that I really hadn't considered. Now I've kind of come to terms with it a little bit. Editing has been uh, very interesting for it, and, and I find that the videos get edited a lot less. At least that's my, been my experience so far with the ones that I've done. There's a lot less editing that's uh, done with the shows. However, going through, and it's, it's kind of a different process. Let me, let me take, take it back a little bit. So when the audio podcasts get done, you know, you record your audio, and then you go in and, you know, you put your intro and outro, you clean up the audio, you know, to somewhat get rid of background noise. You know, hopefully it's not there, but you go through and you do all of this and then, you know, you just export it as, you know, whatever format, MP3, M4A, you export it. And then, you know, you send it up to the file host or, or you know, the hosting service or whatnot. And boom, it's done. You do your post, you get your RSS stuff updated and, and you're done. Well, when you're doing the video, I, I just really hadn't considered how much work this is. So it's easier in some respects to edit it than the audio. And what I mean by that is that the video is what it is and you can't do much to it other than clip out little sections, but it's really noticeable and you don't want to do that all the time. So you're, you're kind of stuck with w whatever you've got. And you go in and, you know, you do your intro and outro and then you have to do, I don't know, anywhere from 20 minutes to two and a half hours of exporting or rendering or whatever you want to call it. So you finally get your file and then you have to upload it to YouTube, which takes, you know, anywhere from another 5, 10, 20 minutes. So you upload it there and then it's ready and then... So right there is about a three hour time window. And after that, you got to post it to BGG and uh, I've got several places where I post it all. And it just, it really surprised me how time consuming all that stuff was. But, you know, I'm not saying that it's time consuming and that I'm complaining. I, I, I enjoy doing it. I like putting this content out there, whether it's the podcast or whether it's the video. And, you know, I enjoy it when people watch it or, or listen to the show. So that's kind of the gratification that I get somewhat for, you know, all the effort that's put into things. So, you know, with the, the videos, definitely check them out. The one new thing for the show, at least uh, for, for the video portion of it, is I've created a YouTube group now. So it's called The Sport Game Life. So definitely go out, check it out, subscribe to it, and then that way you'll be uh, you know, alert of when all the new shows come out or all the new episodes come out or whatever you want to call it, videos come out. And there's also a geek list that I've created as well where I'll post links to all of the, the postings that I put up on YouTube. And one thing that I started doing, which is I think kind of fun, is uh, at each post on the geek list, I started kind of, you know, saying, hey, you know, what happened during you know, the taping of that and, you know, stuff that I kind of learned because I'm finding that I'm learning something new with every recording, you know, whether it's some technical, technical difficulties or, you know, something that I kind of flubbed or, or, or whatnot. So it's in there and I'm trying to make it a little bit of an interesting read and I hope you enjoy that. Definitely look out for more YouTube videos from this board game life. And I really hope that you guys enjoy them and, uh, you know, you'll, you'll have two ways to enjoy the content, the podcast and YouTube. So, uh, you know, also I wanted to say that, 
you know, the podcast is, it's not going to fade away. It's something that, you know, I'm definitely interested in doing still. I have no interest in retiring the podcast. I'm just, I'm going to be doing both the videos and the podcast. Enough about that. Let's uh, move on to some of the topics that I want to talk about for this show. So uh, first off, uh, there's uh, a site that I was made aware of not too long ago called the Esoteric Order of Gamers. So their website is uh, orderofgamers.com. And one thing that they've got on there that I think is really, really cool is that they had a set of videos that explain how to do foam core inserts. Definitely check it out. There's some really cool YouTube videos that they posted of you know how to cut the foam core and, and how to glue it all together. I've attempted this in the past to uh, varying degrees of success. Okay, uh, they haven't been too successful. You know, in terms of uh, the amount of time that was involved, the amount of mistakes that were made, and how things didn't quite fit together. Well, they go through and they kind of explain how to do these things and. You know, it, it, it's awesome. They actually have some plans for a couple of these really cool inserts for Merchant of Venus and Descent. And that's the, the latest Merchant of Venus game that came out not too long ago. And these inserts are awesome. They, they hold everything and, and keep it nice and organized. And you can also use these things to play the game as well. Because for Merchant of Venus... They hold all of those little tiles that go on the left side of the board. So you basically just lift them out of, you know, it's it's like uh, these two little trays. You just lift them out of the box, and then you put them on the side of the board. Boom, you're done for the setup. So, uh, you know, there's been a lot of thought done into this. I applaud their efforts. It's fantastic, and I'm really looking forward to what they're going to be coming out with in the future. So, you know, definitely check that out. Esoteric Order of Gamers, and check out their videos. Uh, if you're interested in the DIY uh, aspect of you know creating stuff with foam core which is uh, pretty darn neat moving on to the next thing i want to talk a little bit about the spiel des Jahres, and you know the winner was announced uh not too long ago and it wound up uh, out of the contenders which w- were quicks hanabi and augustus hanabi won uh, which uh, i'm not sure how how i feel about that totally because i'm not surprised that it won but, you know, I wasn't sure if Augustus was, was going to get it either because I'm still kind of fuzzy with how they make some of these decisions, and not in terms of the process that happens, but, you know, some of their logic. And I, there's a lot of people out there that were actually wrong <laughs> as well just because, uh, you know, yeah, I, I think as, you know, hardcore gamers and uh, such, we think of this a little bit differently than the people that nominate these games. So we went through and we kind of checked out a couple of these games. Like Hanabi is something that we discussed on the podcast uh, a couple episodes ago and, you know, quite a bit of depth. And, you know, it, it's a fun game and, you know, I think it deserves to have the Spiel des Jahres. And uh, we also tried Quicks. And when I say we, that's uh, my wife, Wendy, and I. So, you know, we tried Quicks. We found some uh, stuff up on BGG and we printed out and we were able to cobble, home, you know, a homebrew uh, version of this game and you know we went through and we played it and it was interesting you know Wendy kind of enjoyed it you know wanted to play it a couple of times and uh, you know that was uh, about it I never really had uh, an intense desire to play it again it's not an awful game but for I, I think a lot of you know more advanced gamers or hobbyist gamers it's not something that we're going to be going to very often and even as a filler game I, I don't know how how well that would play as a filler game even. Now again, it, it's not horrible, but you know it, it's not all that great. So uh, that was Quicks. And then there's Augustus. This is the one that I haven't been able to try because uh, it's not out in the U.S. yet. And uh, it's a little difficult to get a hold of. I, I suppose uh, you know could be ordered from Amazon fairly easily or some of those European shops. But uh, it's something that I just never got around to. And I'm actually looking forward to playing Augustus. You know, it's got a little bit of a, a bingo mechanic to it. And uh, bingo is something that uh, I have a long history with. I used to play it a lot uh, when I was a child and got sucked into bingo blitz on my phone not too long ago. So, you know, it's 
uh, it looks like it's going to be interesting. You know, I watched a couple of videos and it's something I'm definitely uh, kind of itching to try. But uh, you know, going back, the, the winner was Hanabi and, uh, you know, very much deservedly so. So that was the, the Spiel des Jahres. For the other winners, uh, what, Legends of Andor won the Kenner Spiel and I forgot the one that won the, the kids one. That was announced a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Legends of Andor is one that I'm also kind of interested in definitely checking out. Um, it's available, of course, in the United States by Fantasy Flight, which is really cool. And, and the art on it is, is awesome. All right, moving on. Uh, we'll go over to uh, Kickstarter. All right, Kickstarter is something that kind of gets tossed around a lot right, in a lot of different shows. You know, it's a hot topic of discussion, you know, are things going to... You know, is is the whole thing going to implode one day? Is the whole Kickstarter uh, model going to collapse? Well, you know, a lot of people made, you know, predictions, and, you know, we've made our predictions here on the show as well. A year later, year and a half later, you know, Kickstarter's still going and seems pretty popular, and it's growing almost. Well, not almost. It, it is growing. There's a lot of stuff that's happening. There hasn't been anything too horrible that's happened yet. Hopefully, they uh, will be vigilant and, you know, they won't let that stuff happen. But uh, the thing that I always thought of Kickstarter was that it was something that really wasn't for me where, you know, I backed a couple of things and, you know, everything went smooth with just about everything. How, however, the thing that I kind of don't like even now is, you know, you get all excited about a game and, you know, you're, interested in backing it, you're, you're seeing the development of it, and then boom, you know, the thing gets funded, and then months or maybe even a year later is when you finally get the product and the hotness, you know, the, the interest in it is kind of waned. So that's something that I still kind of have. I just recently got one of those Ouya consoles, which is, you know, it looks like a little cube. Well, not looks like it is a little cube. It's a little Android uh, gaming console, ordered last summer so i got it a couple weeks ago and i mean that's you're almost waiting a year for that you know i looked back on it and i said you know was it really worth waiting all that time you know where i dropped you know, this thing was 99 dollars, 100 bucks you know not that that's too much but you know it's still you're sinking something into a product that you won't be getting for a long 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 time and only to find it in retail like immediately and, you know, in the case of the Ouya, the retail product wasn't much more. I think it wound up being 110 bucks. But, you know, especially something like technology, it's not something that I really think I would ever do again. Just because you, by the time you order it and by the time you receive it, I mean, could it be that the technology is outdated? We'll have to see. We'll have to see what happens with that and, you know, future uh, Kickstarters and products. However, with board games, uh, I feel a little different about that, uh, partly because, you know, when you've got a board game, it's not like you would lose something. You know, technology is a lot different, you know, versus something like a board game, where a board game, you know, won't necessarily be outdated. You know, it won't fall behind the times, you know, et cetera, as, as easily as something like you know an ouya might i kind of looked down upon kickstarter for some time and then i got caught by a bug the kickstarter bug you know not that i was really you know jumping on the hype of things but i started seeing a couple of things that i really really liked so after gen con last year i went and jumped on the kickstarter for soul forge so Soul Forge is, uh, you know, it's a digital card trading or trading card game by the makers of Ascension, uh, which used to be Gary Games, and now they're Stoneblade. And Stone or Soul Forge is probably one of the best returns I've had on Kickstarter because the thing's awesome. They do regular communications with you, and I've got the Steam version on PC. Uh, there's also an iPad version and. You know, they're talking about doing Android uh, sometime in the future. But this thing, 
I think by far is like one of the coolest things I've kickstarted. It it hasn't cost too much. It was like 20, 25 bucks when it got kickstarted or kickstarted. And it, it was definitely worth it, you know, because some things are like way, way more money. Um, you know, my experience prior to the Wea and Soulforge was D-Day Dice. And to me, that one was kind of a letdown. I had never played the print and play, but when I got it, I was kind of like, meh. But Soul Forge definitely. So other than Soul Forge, uh, I also jumped on Small World Two. So this is uh, again electronic version. Uh, then uh, you know shortly after the recording of episode twenty five, I jumped on Family Vacation. Now this one kind of bummed me out because it didn't get funded, but uh, you know Philip Duberry that designed Family Vacation, he says that the game will get published might not necessarily be kickstarter but uh, they'll look at other avenues to get it going and you know i hope it makes it because it looks like a pretty cool game then uh i jumped on dungeon roll the dicey dungeon delve this one was only 15 dollars, and you got a whole bunch of stuff and i figured 15 bucks you know in some instances you might put you might pay that much just in tax or shipping to get a game so for 15 bucks it was definitely worth it you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to checking that thing out. Then there's a couple of expansions that I got in on, Eminent Domains expansion and the Belfort expansion. Uh, all, all these were by a Tasty Minstrel. Uh, so we got both of those games, looking forward to checking those out. Another one, this is probably the main one that kind of had me a little excited, was Gear and Piston. This game uh, is about old vehicles and kind of, you know, designing them and you know, getting them going. It's, so it looked really good. And this is a game that you can try out on Board Game Arena. So, uh, you know, if you're interested, you know, definitely check it out up there. Uh, then DVG came out with, or Danverson Games came out with Battle for Stalingrad. It's a card-based war game. And this really kind of struck my fancy, so I, I figured I would give it a shot. And, uh, you know, they uh, they had pretty good communication for the game, and, you know, I'm looking forward to checking it out as well. And they put everybody's name on the box, which was kind of cool. Then stuff on Feld, which is uh, a hot topic. You know, as over the last couple of years, he's come out with some fantastic games. He came out with Amerigo, and I had to back it. Had to. I mean, there, <laughs> there was no choice. It's, you know, I, w- I was forced willingly, if that's possible, to get this game. Uh, then uh, Snowdonia came out with uh, an expansion with some new uh, miniatures. Uh, so it was basically the second edition of the game and it had uh, an upgrade kit. So if you have the original Snowdonia, you can upgrade it uh, with some new stuff. So I just picked up the upgrade pack. Uh, Euphoria is another one that I jumped on. Then uh, this is by Stonemeyer Games that did Viticulture. This thing looks awesome. I, I really enjoy worker placement games. The way that they handled this uh, Kickstarter is is awesome. Just the amount of communication they were sending out PNP files. It, it's just fantastic. I mean, kudos to them. And I'm really looking forward to you know getting uh, the final copy of the game. And I'll definitely probably be doing a video on this thing. Then uh, there's a key flower expansion. It's like a little mini expansion with a couple of tiles. They call it Key Celeste. That was only five bucks. Hey, why not? Why not? You know, because, you know, you get it from the BGG store, it costs the same. Now, the thing that was kind of weird about this is that they, uh, once the Kickstarter completed, they actually had you go to the Game Salute store. I mean, Game Salute did this. So they had you go to the Game Salute store. They gave you a code. You input a code, and then they send it out to you right away. So there was like no waiting for this thing. Well, you know, you wait a you know a week or two or whatever to, you know for the thing to ship out to you. But it's not like waiting six eight months. They already had these things printed, and you know, I submitted my information on the Game Salute website, and uh, you know they already shipped it out. Very cool. Very cool. So. Uh, then uh, two more that I want to talk about. Uh, Among the Stars came out the Ambassadors uh, expansion. You know, definitely looking forward to that thing. And then uh, New Amsterdam. So New Amsterdam is uh, being brought over to the United States. 
and they are actually spelling it new, not N Y W N I, whatever it is that the uh, European version has. So Pandasaurus is bringing this out to the U.S., and uh, I, I can't wait to check this one out. I've heard some fantastic things about this game. That's uh, New Amsterdam and the Dutch West India Trading Company. That's that's a really really a long game. So uh, as you can see, over the past couple of months, the amount of games that uh, have piqued my interest on Kickstarter has really jumped, especially over the, the prior two years, probably. And uh, I've, I've really cooled off on it again. I haven't really seen too much that I've really taken a liking to. I think uh, New Amsterdam was the last one. Uh, this thing funded three, four weeks ago. So you know, that's just interesting. I, I thought it would be interesting to talk about how the games that I've, I've backed on here and, and how my opinions of it have changed and now I've cooled off again. So, uh, you know, that, that, that's the uh, little Kickstarter talk. Okay, moving on. Um, we can uh, start talking about uh, the whole slew of games that uh, are in the backlog. Now, I'm not going to go into a whole ton of detail because I don't want this to be a 10-hour long show. So I'm just going to kind of through a lot of these here and considering like we're almost half an hour into the show already i'll spend a couple minutes talking about each one and uh you know just some stuff that i I think is kind of interesting you know first off i guess we can start off with uh that game that won the field is ours hanabi so i just want to mention a couple things about this game and that's that uh it was finally released in the united states as I'm sure everybody everybody probably knows, and uh, it was released by r r Games, and that was fantastic timing on their part. I mean, this thing just hit in the United States. You know, it had been, you know, in the plan for quite some time, and then boom, it, like, wins r- right away. So I'm sure them, you know, that really helped r r Games in terms of probably their bottom line, and I'm, I wouldn't doubt if this thing's probably sold out. It's probably not sold out in all the stores yet, but, you know, the distribution level, you know, probably. And at a price point of only $11, I mean, this thing is, I mean, it's a no-brainer you know, to get this game or not. You know, it's like, yes, you know, don't even think about it. $11, I mean, you spend more money at McDonald's probably for lunch, and uh, you get a lot more value out of this than you do, like, two Big Macs or, or whatnot. Uh, the, the quality of the game, I mean, it's actually pretty good. It comes in a nice little box, and it, the top doesn't flop off like a lot of these uh, little small card box uh, games do. The stuff inside is is nice, you know, decent quality cards. Now, this is a game that I actually brought into work one day, and I introduced it to one of my coworkers, and he loved it. It was like, it was like so different that he's like, "How do I do get my copy?" And he made an interesting comment. He goes, it breaks all the rules of card games, <laughs> you know, especially in terms of, you know, sitting there and, you know, not looking at your own cards. You just look at somebody else's. So it's it's a interesting mechanism. You know, again, we talked about it a lot a couple episodes ago. You know, if you're interested, you know, definitely check out the show where Wendy and I discuss it. it it's a fun game. It's a It's a decent game. You know, after definitely after like one or two plays, you know, you're ready to move on to something else. It's a game that you probably really like, you know, sitting around a table with a bunch of people, you know, having some drinks and, and having fun. You can have some good laughs when you play this game. So that was Hanabi, uh, recent, recently released in the United States by uh, R&R Games and the uh, Spiel des Jahres winner for 2013. All right, another game I want to talk about is Urbion which was uh, designed by Shadi Torby and uh, released by Z-Man Games. Uh, in uh, 2012, initially it was called uh, Equilibrion, I believe. I keep on wanting to say Equilibrium, but that's a movie. And, and decent movie, by the way. Uh, so it was called Equilibrion, but there was some kind of issue with the name, and it got delayed a couple months, I'm sure, while they probably reprinted the boxes and who knows how much that probably cost Z-Man and uh, Philosophia. But uh, the game finally came out uh, this year. And 
it, it's an interesting game. It's it's something that I really enjoy. It's you know for those of you that aren't aware, so Urbion is I don't want to say it's a sequel to Onurim, uh, but both are very similar in some aspects in terms of they're both card games. They involve dreams. They have similar art, and and they're designed by the same person, Shadi Torby. But uh, this is a game that I really enjoy a lot more than Onurim. You know, I'm not going to say that Onurim is bad. It's just uh, uh, not for me. The the shuffling of the game really kind of irks me after a while. I, I was always thinking if I sleeve it, maybe it'll be a little bit better, but I never got around to doing that. I did sleeve Urbion, so it is sleeve worthy, which uh, says a lot. I guess if you're going to be dropping a couple bucks worth of sleeves on the game, you know, that, that does say something. So Urbion is uh, it, it's a little bit of a, a like a mathy puzzly style of game where the whole premise is that there's good dreams and bad dreams i can never remember what the good dreams are called I'm like snog day or something like that and then incubi are the yeah those are the bad dreams so what you're doing is there's these cities and then there's good dreams and bad dreams in the city and you're trying to go and equalize the good and the bad dreams. Each card has a number on it, you know, like uh, one to five, positive or negative. The good dreams are positive, bad dreams are negative. And so what you're doing on your turn is you're playing cards, you're playing dreams to the cities uh, to, you know, pump up the numbers or, or, or drop them down to equalize. So let's say you have, you know, minus seven on, on the left side and plus seven on the right side, then you can equalize that city and claim that city as points. There's 12 cities in the game. Once you claim all 12 and you win, but if you lose, uh, or not if you lose, but you lose if you run out of cards. So if you go through the entire deck and you don't equalize all 12 cities, then the game's over and you're done. Uh, it also comes with a couple expansions. I haven't really done much with the expansions because I enjoy the base game enough that, uh, at least uh, so far, I haven't found it necessary to use them. But uh, they do seem decent. But, you know, the game as a whole, I, I really enjoy it. I, I like the like the puzzly, mathy aspect of it. It's surprisingly uh, not as simple as it seems, just because I think that the way that it's been kind of balanced a little bit, where it, it's at the point of where if you aren't careful with what you do, you just run out of cards. And that's what happens to me the majority of the time i just run out of cards i don't get everything uh, you know equalized in time and you know i have no problem playing it again you know you play it a couple times three four times you know i am ready to go on to something else it scratches that like solo play fun itch you know just a little bit but you don't at least i don't find myself wanting to play it over and over and over and over and over it's entertaining and I enjoy it. I do recommend it. If you liked Onurim, uh, you might definitely like this game. There's been some discussions on BGG where people are really disappointed by it. I would almost say that if you didn't like Onurim, you might like Urbion. But if you did like Onurim, then there's a chance you might be disappointed if you're looking for more Onurim style play. So that, that's Urbion. I, I enjoy it. This is a game that I, I would recommend to people. It's not by any means, you know, a super crazy heavy game. It's not going to wow you with, you know, the ability to, you know, do your strategy moves on it or anything like that. But, you know, if you take it for what it is, it's a very enjoyable game. So that's Urbion, double thumbs up for me. So then another game that was up for the Spiel des Jahres was Quix, as I had mentioned earlier. And uh, I keep wanting to say Kix, which is that old uh, arcade game from back in the 80s but it's uh it was it's called quicks uh it was designed by stephen bendorf and it came out last year and uh you know it's a light dice game where you have these pads of paper and you've got six dice that you roll and what you do is uh you have these rows on your paper from uh, 2 to 12 or 12 to 2 depending on the row and what you're doing is basically going through and trying to mark off as many uh, of these squares as you can. And it's a very simple game. You can teach it to just about anybody. 
in just a couple of minutes. You know, I don't know what else I could say about it. It's 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 an okay game. It's slightly entertaining. The replay value, at least on me, is lost. I recently showed up uh, by one of my buddy's uh, game groups that he had going, and they were playing it. I almost was hoping that they wouldn't play it again <laughs> after they finished their game. So, uh, you know, thankfully they didn't. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about this game. It's 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 okay. It's average. Uh, it's something you might want to pull out with your parents or something like that. But beyond that, it's not all that entertaining. So that's Quicks. Uh, okay, next game I want to talk about is Pinata. So this is a game designed by Stephen Glenn. And it uh, came out uh, by Rio Grande Games in 2013. Now, Pinata is uh, basically uh, Balloon Cup. So if you're familiar with Balloon Cup, or if you're familiar with Balloon Cup on Yucata, then you know, you'll know what this game is. I mean, in, in this one, you're instead of doing balloons like you are in Balloon Cup, here you're doing uh, uh, pinatas. So there's four pinata pads. You know, some you know go uh, ascending, some are going down, and you're you're putting uh, you know cards on either side of these little pinata boards, and you're looking to collect uh, candy that's on them. So in Balloon Cup, there's like little colored cubes. I guess representing balloons. Here you've got candy. Uh, and, they're, and they're cool little candy-shaped pieces of wood. Uh, there are some slight changes between pinata and balloon cup. You know, Some argue for the better, some argue for the worse. But uh, the game is uh, rather enjoyable. It, you know, I, I introduced this to my wife, Wendy, and she loved it. And she actually immediately started playing balloon cup on Yucata. This game also, we had a horrible accident with it, unfortunately, where a drink was spilled on the table and then it kind of messed up the cards and some of the boards. And we really haven't touched it since, unfortunately. It's a, it's a pretty cool game. If you like Balloon Cup, definitely check this thing out. The uh, price point of it is, is fairly reasonable. It's, it's fun. It's, it's a fun, fun game. Again, this is one that you can probably introduce to a lot of people you know, that aren't necessarily like huge gamers. You could probably play it on a lunch break uh, with people at work. It's uh, it, it's a good game. It usually plays in less than 30 minutes. And it is a two-player game. When I say with people at work, you'll be playing one of them at a time. And hopefully they'll be playing with you. But, you know, definitely check it out. So that's uh, Pinata from uh, Stephen Glenn and Rio Grande Games. Okay, next game I want to talk about is Clash of Cultures. Clash of Cultures came out um, in 2012 and it was designed by Christian Markison and released by Z-Man Games here in the United States. Uh, it's a two to four player game and it, it's got a long playing time. So playing time is actually 240 minutes. Probably say that, you know, that, that's pretty much uh, close. So that's uh, up to four hours. It can take to play this game. So you probably definitely don't want to start at midnight, at least if you want to get any rest the next day. So it's something you want to play early on. Now, uh, I got a couple of things about this game. Well, first off, it's got a lot of components to it. It's got, um, let's see here, more than 250 miniatures. The, the miniatures, were, I'm, I'm kind of mixed on the miniatures at least. Was there? I mean, there's a lot of miniatures. There's a lot of stuff. Uh, the quality of the miniatures is uh, is kind of questionable. They're that really soft plastic, you know. Where, you know, think of like those army men that you probably had as you were a little, a little kid. So the army men, you know, you got some that are like standing up straight. You got other ones that you know aren't standing up. You know, not so much straight. There's and, and so forth. You know, you know what I mean. And so the you know the pieces had a lot of flash to them. It was just I don't say a little disappointing, but it was just kind of like hmm, maybe they could have done this a little bit better. But you know, with 250 miniatures, you know maybe that would have doubled the cost of the game. Who knows? Then the other thing I wanted to mention about this game was that it has probably done something that I think a lot of people didn't think could be done, and that's that. They implemented a tech tree in a board game. 
And it was actually pretty cool the way that they did it, where they gave you these boards and, you know, they're not quite as big as a letter size sheet of paper, um, you know, somewhat smaller, but they gave you these boards and the boards have little squares in them. And what you wind up doing is as you're going through and building up your tech tree for your civilization, you put cubes in those little squares. So, you know, you know, tech trees, if you played video games, you know, it's kind of like you get this skill and then it branches off from there. So it's like, you know, um, you know I'll, I'll use something rudimentary. It's like you learn how to hold a bow. Okay, so then you've got like the bow holding skill. And then, you know, you advance that by spending like a skill point. You advance that one step forward. And it's like, well, you learn how to shoot. And then you learn how to, you know, like aim. And then, you know, you might get an addition to the bow, like let's say like a uh, laser sight or something. <laughs> but it continues that way. So the tech tree is exactly that. You gain one piece of technology to help your civilization. And then from that point on, you know, you might have two other things that you could get and you choose those and it helps your civilization out and, uh, and so forth. And they, that was a, a pretty slick way to do it. I was really surprised, especially like after the game was over and I really started thinking about the game and, you know, how everything went and, you know, I really started to appreciate it. And it's got some um, interest. It's got an interesting way of revealing the land where it sees you know, they're not really hexagonal. They're just these, uh, like, clusters of different uh, land type, and you flip these over. And it's kind of a, a neat mechanism for, uh, you know, doing discovery or you know, fog of war, whatever you want to call it. So Clash of Cultures, uh, I found it interesting. It's something that I would definitely be interested in playing again. However, the, the time amount of time that it takes to play the game kind of puts me off a little bit. So I'm, I'm kind of mixed on the game. You know, it's, I, I like it. I can appreciate the stuff that it has and, you know, I'm intrigued to experience it again, but it just, it just takes so long. It just takes so long. So, you know, this is something that I would definitely say, you know, give it a, a try, see if you can play it before, you know, you might want to pick it up. And definitely do consider, it's like, how often can you get this thing to the table? Such a long, long, long play time. So uh, that's Clash of Cultures by uh, Z-Man. Now another game that uh, I guess was also kind of long, but this one was uh, definitely interesting as well, is uh, Yido. This is a game that came out in 2012 by uh, Thomas Van Ginsty. And uh, Wolf Plink. This is uh, from Eggerspiel, and uh, it'll be released in the U.S. by Pandasaurus. Pandasaurus is bringing it, uh, uh, hopefully soon. I forgot to uh, see when it's going to be coming out, but I believe it's coming out pretty soon here in the U.S. So it was released in uh, 2012. It plays two to five, and uh, this is also another long game. So they say about 150 minutes, so it's two and a half hours to play. This has got a whole bunch of different mechanisms. You know, it's got an auction mechanic, set collection, worker placement. I mean, I really enjoy set collection, worker placement style games. Auction and bidding, it depends. I mean, I'm sort of like 50-50 on those games. But it had all these different elements that just came together so, so well. And I had originally seen a bunch of people play this game and it looked so busy. The, the board is huge. And, you know, just by looking at it across the room, you, you're not really sure what's going on because there's, again, the board is massive and there's just so much stuff on it. You know, all these cards, different sizes, you got pieces everywhere. You got this little dude rotating around uh, the central area of the board. And it, it was odd. I, I really hadn't had that much interest in it. And then when we broke it out to play a couple weeks later, once I got the gist of the game and, and it started playing, I really started to enjoy the game. And once the game was done, it's like, I got to get this game. This thing's fantastic. Now, 
towards the end of the game, I did feel like it was going on too long. However, having the rules explained and so forth, and I think it was kind of late in the late in the night. When you go late in the night, things tend to uh, not go so well sometimes, you know, just because everybody's tired, especially after a long day's work. But this game is something that is definitely going to be on my list of games that I, I definitely got to check out. You know, once it comes here in the U.S., you know, I'd definitely be looking forward to picking this game up. This is something that if you like worker placement style games, um, you know, definitely check this thing out. I don't know if I can definitely recommend it to everybody you know, just because of the play time. The longer the games get, the harder it is to get to the table because, you know, you need the time commitment and you got to get the time commitment from the people that you're playing with and, you know, not totally turn them off or exhaust them. If you see this thing being played over by your local game group, definitely try to get a game in or at your local store or wherever. Definitely do check this game out. And if you like the style of games that I like, you know, with the worker placement and so forth, I think you'll definitely like this game. This was extremely well done. When you look at this board, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, this thing's massive. I mean, and it is huge. <laughs> it's something that it will definitely stand out. So, uh, Definitely check out Yido. It's got a lot of cool elements in the game all thrown in together in, in, a, in a good way, in a good way. So uh, that's Yido. That one gets a thumbs up for me. Now, Stuff Unfeld is, is a name that is, you know, pretty uh, well known in the board game uh, industry, uh, especially as of late, but last couple of years. And he's had three games that have come out this year, and that's not counting the um, one that was on Kickstarter just recently. Amergo, the one of the th three games that he had that came out this year was Bruges, which uh, is going to be coming out in the U.S. Uh, by Z-Man, and it's called uh, Bruges, Bruges. So it's basically the same, the same name, just uh, in the U.S. pronunciation. So uh, again, it was designed by Stefan Feld, uh, artist Michael Menzel, which is uh, Legends of Andor fame. Uh, so this was published in 2013, two to four players, and uh, it's got uh, a much more reasonable time, uh, playing time of 60 minutes. And this was a game that I had played recently. Uh, I think we had four people playing, and it was really, really cool. It was, uh, it was again, it was kind of late in the night. I I was really tired, and for some reason I wasn't getting some of the rules, but everybody was nice and patient with me. And uh, I, I really enjoyed this game. This game is really cool. It's got a lot of cards. It's got an, an interesting way of dealing with the cards where you make these piles and you kind of shift stuff around. But uh, it, it's essentially, you know, a card game. Here on BGG, they, they list it as a card game, city building, dice, and renaissance. You know, it, it's it's got a really cool way of, of just bringing all these different things together. And I, I know I'm not doing the game justice with that explanation, but it's just awesome because these cards can be used for different things. And, you know, you play them in front of you and there's multiple colors. Uh, I, I need to mention that it is not all too colorblind friendly. Uh, I did have trouble with two sets of the colors so, you know, the, you know, the typical red green problem that, you know, most of us have and, you know, brown kind of gets into there a little bit, you know, that's definitely a problem, but this is one of those games that uh, maybe it's the lighting also, but I have uh, blue and purple problems as well. So, uh, you know, definitely keep that in mind if you're looking to get this game and you are colorblind. I'm not too bad with my color blindness, but I know some people that are worse off, they might really, really struggle with this game. But uh, yeah, Bruges is fantastic. It is a, a really cool game, and it's one that I'm looking forward to definitely uh, getting a hold of. You know, it's got uh, a large board in the center of the table where you go through and try to build walls around the city. Uh, there's a track, you got your little worker guys, your little soldier guys, whatever they were, 
Uh, it, it's just a fantastic game. I, I'm not going to go into too much information on this thing. You know, there's a, a, a lot of information on BGG about this game. I'm just giving you guys the recommendation. This thing's pretty darn cool. It's uh, a lot of fun. Definitely, definitely check it out. This is, you know, without any hesitation, a double thumbs up for me. So since we started talking about uh, Stefan Feld a little bit, let's continue with some more talk on Stefan Feld, the Castles of Burgundy. You know, this game came out uh, a couple of years ago, about two years ago. And, you know, it's been released in the U.S. It's out uh, in Europe. So it's available everywhere. And uh, it's, it's definitely a fun game. So it was designed by Stefan Feld. It was released by Aaliyah, uh, Aaliyah Ravensburger. It's uh, got about an hour and a half playing time, plays two to four, and I played a whole bunch of this game. I introduced it to my wife, Wendy, and I was uh, you know, pleasantly surprised to find that she really, really enjoyed it. It's got your typical you know, Stefan Feld busyness to it with a lot of choices, but you know, once somebody kind of gets over the busyness of the board and it's like, Oh my gosh, what do I do? There's like 4,000 things for me to do. And you kind of like, you know, relax with that and you kind of take the game in. You actually find that it's a lot, a lot of fun. This game has always been a pleasant surprise, you know, especially if you like dice games. And uh, I think lately Stefan's been building in, you know, a lot of dice games. Uh, So, you know, Castles of Burgundy, if you guys haven't tried it yet, and I'm, I'm sure you probably already have. If you haven't tried it, definitely give it a try. And you can introduce it to people that aren't necessarily like, you know, hardcore gamers, but you know, people that were just a little bit above gateway level, they would probably really, really enjoy this because it's just such a unique style of game. And it's got all these cool little mechanisms in it that it just, it, it, it's so cool. Definitely check it out. There was uh, an expansion of sorts uh, in a Spielbox magazine where you got a couple more boards. You know, you definitely might want to check uh, out getting that issue because uh, that gives you, so each board is double-sided. So it gives you eight maps, additional maps to play from. And I don't know if that's available elsewhere, but, uh, you know, definitely expands the game a little bit. So Castles of Burgundy from Stefan Feld, fantastic game. Uh, very cool mechanisms to it and uh you know if my wife wendy likes the game then that means it's definitely something special so uh, that's castles of burgundy but another game that i introduced wendy to was alien frontiers now this is a game that was released by clever mojo games uh it's what almost three years ago now so this was uh the runaway hit on kickstarter when it came out you know, got a lot of press. I think it was the the first game that actually did really, really well on Kickstarter. Alien Frontiers was uh, designed by Tori Neiman, released by uh, Clever Mojo Games in 2010. Plays two to four, 13 and up, about an hour and a half uh, play time. So this game was kind of surprising because, I mean, I enjoy the game. It's It's a fairly decent game, you know, a little... I don't say dated nowadays, but, you know, games have progressed, you know, a little, using some of these mechanisms, you know, a little further since this game came out. And I introduced it to my wife, Wendy, and at the end of the game, it kind of fell flat with her, which I was really, really surprised about. I thought that she would really enjoy this game. And, you know, the whole dice mechanism was cool and it's present in other games, uh, the the thing that was uh, really surprising to me was at the end, she basically said that the way things had gone in the game, there was no way for her to catch up. You know, everything, there's there's no hidden element to the game. Everything was kind of exposed, like the entire time, and there was really not much of a hidden element, like, you know, that tension. It's like, okay, here's, you know, I've got X amount of points on the board, and then I've got X amount of points hidden in my cards or whatever out in front of me or behind my little barricade. It's, it's one of those games where, what I'm kind of getting at is you have those games where at the end of the game, everybody might have, let's say like 10 points, but then boom, it's like you, when you count everything up, you're like, okay, this guy's got 90, this guy's got 87, this guy's 92. All right, 92 wins. 
you know what I mean? Those games where you add up all the points at the end and, you know, people just shoot up and you have no idea where anybody's going. You kind of have an idea of how you're doing, but you don't know if Fred or Larry or whoever are going to just shoot up above you. So she had uh, issues with this game and it just detracted from the fun level of the game. And, you know, I know there's a lot of people that still enjoy the game. It's got a fairly high level on BGG because it's still a 7.53 after all these years, which is a fairly decent score, and that's with um, uh, 5,700 ratings. Yeah, it fell flat. You know, I enjoyed the game. I mean, partly probably because I won. But, uh, you know, that was just surprising. I thought I would mention that. So, you know, that's uh, Alien Frontiers, and, you know, this is a game that's decent. Uh, I did want to say also that I was kind of disappointed in the quality of the game. I don't remember which print run of the game I have. You know, I, I wasn't in on the Kickstarter. I did get it afterwards, so this might be the second printing or, or the first. Actually, no, I think it was the first one. But I, I, So it was the Kickstarter printing, but I got it after the Kickstarter. But the, the boards were kind of warped, and they didn't f- sit right in the box anymore. It was just disappointing. You know, I don't know if they could have done anything different with the game, but maybe it just speaks to as, you know, whoever did the manufacture for the game and hopefully later printings are better quality. So again, that was uh, Alien Frontiers released in 2012 by Liver Mojo Games. Okay, another game I want to talk about is Voluspa. So this is a game that was released in 2012. Uh, by Scott Caputo and uh, White Goblin Games. Recently, it got brought over to the United States by Stronghold Games. Uh, plays two to five players, 10 and up, 45 minutes or so. So just shy of an hour to, uh, to play the game. This is a, a tile-laying game where it's set in uh, like a Norse mythology type of theme. And Oh, and by the way, this is a remake of the game Kachina which came out a couple of years back. So it's uh, essentially the same game with a couple of changes. They changed some of the tiles, but the gameplay is, is pretty much about the same. And uh, this game, I, you know, I was really looking forward to it and it's a really enjoyable game. It's, it's a, it's a lot of fun. It's not super deep. It's a little, you know, it's, it's a light game, but it has a little bit of, like a thinky aspect to it where it kind of scratches that itch of tile placement where you're like, I'm trying to place this tile in the best possible place. You know, where can I play it? How can I block my opponent or opponents? You know, what are they going to do? And how can I maximize my score? It it just, it brings up a couple of things together in a surprising way. And it's an extremely simple game to learn. It's extremely simple. They're, the base game has eight different tiles. Each of them behaves a little bit differently. And what you're basically doing is you're making rows and columns of these things because on your turn, you're either playing a tile or discarding a tile from your hand. And hopefully you're not discarding because that means you're not, or hopefully you're, yeah, hopefully you're not discarding because that means you're not scoring any points that turn. But you're basically playing these tiles down, and you're scoring these rows and columns. You've got all these different Norse characters, you know, gods. There's Odin and Thor, and there's this wolf, Fenrir, and and so forth. And each tile has a different ability. Like there's a Valkyrie, where if you put Valkyries at the outsides of the column or the row, you score one point for every tile in between them. If you place, like each of these tiles has a number on it from one going up to, I think the highest is eight. So if you place, let's say Thor, Thor is like seven or eight, I forget which uh, number he is. But if you place him and he's the highest in that row, you score one point for every tile. If, uh, if you put it at a junction where it's a, column in a row and it's the highest in both of those you score one point for every column tile and one point for every row tile 
it's uh you know a fairly basic game but it's just i mean it's cool it's 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 fun and it just brings together you know the tile laying and a fair bit of strategy together in just the right way to make it an awesome game and i was also pleasantly surprised that it wasn't in a tin (laughs) because a bunch of the stronghold games of late have been coming in the tins you know particularly the ones that have been the the dual printings with white goblin uh you know like i can think of like the what panic station and the revolvers and uh, there's the new one that they have the the vampire game you know they all come in those tins the tins are nice but they just for me, they don't fit on the shelf really. So this, this comes in a nice box, and the tiles were all pre-punched, which uh, is good or bad. I, I really like punching my components out, <laughs> and uh, you know I'm sure there's you guys out there will, will know what I mean. It's it's just fun to punch everything out and sort it and everything. But you know this this one has everything pre-punched. It all comes in a bag, and they're all nicely pre-punched, so you know they're not torn or. And it also has an expansion, and this expansion includes four other characters, uh, four other sets of tiles, which make the game a little more interesting. And the uh, expansion does look uh, pretty cool. I haven't played with it yet, but it adds some interesting elements to the game. So this is a game, don't expect it to be you know super crazy, intense strategy, but it, it's definitely fun. It's, uh, you know, something that people would probably enjoy, you know, playing at the beginning of a gaming session or even at the end, you know, where it's late in the, late in the night and people are getting kind of tired. It might be a good one to finish the night off. with. So this is one that I definitely enjoy and, and I would definitely recommend to people. And that's Voluspa by uh, Scott Caputo and uh, Stronghold Games and White Goblin Games. Okay, two more that I want to cover real quick uh, for this show over here. Uh, Number one being Dominion Guilds. So this is the latest uh, version or latest uh, expansion for the game Dominion that I'm sure everybody is well aware of. So Guilds is the latest expansion. came out in 2013. And, uh, you know, Donald X. Vaccarino designed it, uh, as, as with all the others, plays two to four, uh, came out in 2013, playing time 30 minutes. Now, I've got uh, pretty much all of the Dominion expansions, and including the base games. And this is a game that we used to play a lot, a lot at the house. Almost every weekend, we would bust out Dominion and play it. And the different expansions, you know, have varying levels of success. You know, the last one was, uh, was it Dark Ages? Did a lot of trashing mechanisms. Uh, this one really fell flat with us. It, it was one that, you know, I really, I really didn't enjoy it. It just, you know, it, it's got uh, this one new mechanism where you can overpay for cards, and then the more you overpay, the, you know, kind of like the, the more of a benefit you might get from it. And it was just something that, yeah, the, it it didn't really work with us, and I found that every game that we've played with this, I just went for money. It just the the cards that we had on the table, I mean, maybe I'm not using them right or whatnot, but it, it just they, they 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 didn't jive with me, and I just went for money. And you know, it's like money, 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 and then you grab like one or two cards, which were I would grab one or two cards, which were usually the cheapies, you know, for like two or three uh, coins, and then just sit there and just try to crank, you know, crank out as much money as I could to, you know, buy up uh, eight point provinces. Yeah. Provinces. So, um, this was also one cause I've sleeved all the other sets. This is one that we didn't sleeve <laughs> and I don't think it's going to happen. And, uh, I don't think we sleeved dark ages either. I don't know, but, uh, yeah, dominion guilds, I was really disappointed by it. And, after we had played it, I think we played three games of it. You know, we were just like, yeah, let's go watch TV. We were kind of done with it. And I'm really not looking forward to playing it again. So that was Dominion Guilds. If you're a diehard Dominion fan, maybe you might want to check it out. You know, definitely try to play it by somebody. 
otherwise it's not one that I can recommend. Uh, so that was Dominion Guilds by Donald X. Vaccarino and released by Rio Grande Games here in the U.S. just recently here in 2013. And then the last game that I want to talk about is Ascension, Rise of Vigil. So this is the latest and greatest of the Ascension expansions where it seems like there's more of it and more and more of them coming out uh, faster than ever. So Ascension, Rise of Vigil, released in 2013, uh, designed by Justin Gary of Stoneblade Entertainment, uh, and it plays two to four, you know, 13 and up, 30 minutes or so per game. Now, each Ascension expansion kind of introduces something new. So, you know, you had the original game. And there was uh, the first expansion for it, which was essentially just a bunch of cards, and you could reuse the original board. And then they came out with almost kind of like Ascension 2.0, the Storm of Souls, and, uh, and then the expansion for that, Immortal Heroes, those were meant to be played together. And then this is kind of like the, the third one. You know, this comes with another board. The coloring's a little bit different on, on the board, so it's not the same as the other ones. And uh, it introduces a, a new mechanic to Ascension where you get uh, these uh, shards, energy shards. So these are a, a new type of uh, mechanism in the game where you, if you get an energy shard in your hand, it essentially powers up cards. And let's say if you had two energy shards, then you get this extra ability. And it, it actually added an interesting mechanism to the game. It totally changed the game around. It, it's like Ascension, but it's... Like, like Ascension Plus, almost, where it kind of changes the way that you play the game and it slows it down slightly. It's not that it that's a bad thing to do. It's, uh, it's just different. And uh, we really enjoyed it. it. It's As these Ascension games have progressed, we find that we enjoy the new ones more and more. So... You know, when the first one came out, you know, we used to play that a lot. And then we incorporated uh, what uh, the, the Fallen expansion. So we incorporated that into the game. And, you know, it, it was definitely interesting. Storm of Souls came out. Then, you know, we didn't touch the, the first two at all. Mortal Heroes came out. And, you know, that was a lot of fun. I think we played that one by itself. I don't think we even mixed it with Storm of Souls. And now this one came out, Rise of Vigil came out, and I don't really find the need to want to play the like the first four uh, releases at all, just because this one is kind of, it's. I mean, this is standalone. I think you can mix it with the other versions, but it's like we really don't want to because we enjoy the, the game as so much as it is. So if you're a fan of Ascension, you know, definitely pick this one up. It's probably... I got to say like the best one yet. And I just heard that they're coming out with yet another uh, release uh, in the next couple of months. So it seems like, like uh Stoneblade's coming out with a new Ascension game what, every six months or so, maybe even less like every four to six months. So with Ascension just going crazy, you know, them, you know, keep releasing new, new stuff for it and creative and actually better stuff you know the game isn't declining it's not like you know they had a good thing with chronicle of the god slayer and then each one is like sub slowly slowly subpar they're actually improving the game and they're making it a lot more fun and uh you know they're also coming out with uh, soul forge the digital game so i mean stone blades got you know a bunch of hits on their hands and Rise of the Vigil is fantastic. So if you like Ascension, this is one that I can definitely recommend. We really enjoy this game and find that it's a lot of fun. It uh, you know, kind of kicks up the notch in Ascension a little bit, makes it more interesting. Uh, you know, a little, I can't say it gives you more strategy, but it just, it just kicks it up a notch to make it more interesting so you don't get bored with the game if you've been playing it a lot. Again, that's... Rise of the Vigil from Stoneblade Entertainment uh, came out in 
came out in 2013. Love it, love it, love it. Good stuff. Definitely check it out if you want to check it out. All right, so you know, let's uh, move on over to the game list section. So game list is uh, where I talk about games that are coming out sometime in the near future. And there are games that I'm really interested in checking out and can't wait to get my hands on them. So first off, there's a U.S. release of Targi. Targi? Not quite sure. That's probably Targi. T-A-R-G-I. So this is a Cosmos two-player game in their two-player line that's been out for some time, probably at least a year. And it's also out on Yucata. And this game is really, really cool. It's an innovative game. It's, uh, I guess, you could call it worker placement, but it uses cards. It's just a, a really cool way of bringing together a couple of different mechanisms in such a unique way. It's something that we really haven't seen before. You place these cards in essentially like a grid, and you have an outside track where you place your workers and then at the intersection you place three workers and your intersection of your three workers is where you place a cylinder that's a wooden cylinder and you get the ability of that particular card uh, at that intersection and then wherever you place your worker you also get the ability of that card when the you know cards are resolved they, they change types because there's two different types of cards and it's got some set collection kind of stuff going on. It's like worker placement, set collection stuff, you know, definitely check out the information on this game. If you haven't heard of it before, uh, if you play, if you've played it on, you could, uh, I don't know if that's a good representation of the game, especially if you've never played it live, you know, with the, with the actual game. But I think the actual game is uh, actually better than the Yucata implementation. Again, I have a, I'm sure you've heard me in, in previous shows talk about how Yucata is awesome, but the fact that it's not real time kind of detracts from some games like uh, Luna. If you try to learn how to play Luna, I mean, it's, it's, it's just an awful experience because you just don't know what you're doing. Stuff doesn't make sense. But if you're sitting there and you're playing it live, I mean, it's it's a totally different game. It's an enjoyable thing. So Targi is uh, something that I'm really looking forward to, and it's a fairly inexpensive game. It's a it's part of their two player line, and uh, if you haven't heard of it, definitely check it out. Another game that I'm looking forward to. This is a game that's been delayed uh, for some time. It's a couple months late now, but it. They say it's going to be here soon in the U.S. It's actually supposedly in the Z-Man warehouses as I'm recording this. And that game is Robinson Crusoe. I believe I mentioned that on the last episode as part of my game list. Well, I'm still game listing after this thing. This thing looks amazing. Uh, you can also solo play it. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, definitely check this thing out. Then... Uh, another one that I'm interested in is Augustus. You know, there's been a lot of buzz about the game, particularly since it got nominated for Spiel des Jahres 2013. It didn't win, unfortunately, but it looks like an interesting game. They almost call it like Gamer Bingo. Again, it's a, it's a light game. You know, not super light, but it's, it's in the light category. And it's one that really looks interesting to me, especially since uh, I, I enjoy bingo uh, to a point. And then uh, the the last game for the game list section here is going to be Bruges, Bruges or whatever it's going to be called in the U.S. release. So Bruges, fantastic game. I did manage to get a play in of this uh, at a friend's house, but uh, you know I'd be looking forward to getting my own copy and uh, being able to call it my own. So uh, that's Bruges. You know, this, uh, let's call it a wrap for this episode over here. You know, I'd hoped to keep it uh, right around an hour. It's, uh, it's good to be back in the recording seat and, uh, you know, definitely look forward to more shows and more videos uh, in the future from this board game life. So uh, in closing, you know, make sure to uh, check out our guild. Become a member of the guild if you're not a member already. Also, uh, this board game life is on Twitter. It's T Board Game Life. So, uh, you know, 
follow us on Twitter. Uh, the website, thisboardgamelife.com, has been recently redesigned, and some uh, new com- content will go up there pretty darn soon. There's a YouTube group uh, that you can subscribe to. It's This Board Game Life. And there's a geek list uh, that I've created on uh, BGG that's going to have all the information uh, for the you know different YouTube videos that I'm posting. So that uh, all the information and links for all of those will be in the guild. So you can search for the guild and look at the look at the information in there. And uh, I'll be posting this in uh, all of the relevant places on BGG as well, just so you can find it in multiple places. That concludes episode number 26, everybody. Hey, thanks for listening. Talk to you next time.